Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. We got with us Adondra Ritzenthaler, CEO of Azamara Cruises. Azamara Cruises has a fleet of four mid-sized ships that carry about 700 guests in oceans, rivers, and they are able to dock at locations that the bigger ships can't access. Adondra joins us from Colorado. Good to have you with us this afternoon. You've been in the travel industry for four decades, 20 years in airlines, 20 years in cruises. Give us an idea of the environment that you see right now and remind everyone of the guest profile of the folks at, uh, at Azamara Cruises. So thank you so much, first of all, uh, to both of you for having me on. And I do not blame you for wanting to share a room. We've got plenty of space. You can all have your own uh, <laughs> state room with us. Um, but it was funny hearing that. And yeah, the, uh, the industry is really beaming. And uh, we're excited that we're back in the water and that cruising is really taking off. In fact, it's rebounding much faster than other uh, vacation uh, experiences where we're actually up 107% versus 19 by the end of 23 when uh, trips to international destinations were actually down 12%. And so we have continued to see that momentum into 2024 and 25 is actually looking even stronger. And the audience for really the Azamara brand is that affluent traveler who has both the time and the desire to really get immersed in these beautiful destinations around the world. So tell us a little bit about Azamara Cruises, because I don't know that it's as well known, to be fair, as some of the uh, big cruise liners that uh, are publicly traded. Tell us a little bit about who you guys are, how long you've been around, where you typically, um, you know, sail to, and who is your customer? Absolutely. So um, we have actually been around since 2007. And we are smaller. And in fact, we kind of like that a lot, Carol, that we are smaller. Uh, you, you mentioned it. There's four ships. They each hold about 700 guests. And we love that because it's a, a much more personal and intimate experience. And uh, we go all over the world. In the, in the summertime, we actually have all four of our ships in Europe because there's so much demand in the Europe marketplace whether you're doing a country intensive in Spain or Italy or Greece, we have those. And then we actually branch out and do things like Africa and South America. And, you know, some of those places, Japan is really hot and we have cruises that go all through that region. What is it? And so what we, yeah. Is it currency? Is it, what's going on? Everybody's going to Japan Everybody's going to Japan. Sebastian just back from Japan. You know, Elizabeth Elizabeth just back from Japan. Like our whole team is going to Japan. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because it definitely is hot and there's no question. And you can see that because y'all are living it as well. I think it was because, you know, it was the last to come back after the pandemic. And so there's pent up demand. And that's why we have so much of our cruising going there, uh, because just like y'all are seeing, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the demographics that want to take an Azamara cruise and really get immersed. Like when you go to Japan, you may go to one destination and stay for for five or six days. What we do is we let you go in for a a full day or maybe even two days because we do a lot of overnights where other cruise lines don't. And then we let you go experience another part of it. And that's what's really special about the Azamara brand. We really get immersed in the destination. Hey, if, um, Dondra, if uh, demand is so high right now, why do you only have four ships? <laughs> well, you know, we are owned by Sycamore, which is a private equity firm out of New York. And we very much have discussions with them ongoing in growing our, our uh, beautiful company because we would like to get three, four more ships so that we can go in even more places and take our guests around the world. Uh, But that's where we are today. And we're going to keep being successful in the marketplace and growing the business and using our travel advisors, which really are a huge distribution channel to us. And then as we grow, I suspect that uh, our uh, private equity firm will allow us to grow by getting new builds. Well, well. give, give us an idea. We're not, you know, we're not in the cruise business and I don't think many of our listeners and viewers are. So Um, how much does it cost to build one of these ships and what would be the lead time that you would need from ordering it to when it's actually delivered? Well, it's usually about an 18 to 20 month, um, 
in advance. Like okay. you go in and you That's secure the shipyard. And then, you know, it takes a while because we have to design them. We have to then make sure that they're built safely. And uh, so it really does take a little bit. And, uh, you know, as far as how much it costs, I don't know how much it would cost for our ships because I came from my decade in the business that you mentioned earlier. We had much bigger ships. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't want to give the price for those because it won't cost us would as it, much. Would it be we're like gonna stay in that we're talking ship. tens of millions or hundreds of millions? Hundreds of millions. OK. They're still big. Yeah, they're, they're still, still big, big ships. They're still um, big ships. So go back it's, to it's a big ticket item. Okay. Listen, I was, you know, playing around on the website and and looking at, you know, two people for twelve nights in the Caribbean. Um, it looks like it could cost five, six, seven, eight, like it can go up the tier. Give us a range of the costs of taking like a twelve night cruise to the cure, the Eastern cure, uh, Caribbean. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, the Caribbean is definitely a place that we go, uh, but those are actually the the less expensive cruising because there's so much capacity that goes into the Caribbean market. And we do it very differently than any of the competitors in that marketplace. But you could go anywhere from, you know, we have different cabin categories. Our suites, which are the ones that sell the, you know, first, actually are, you know, anywhere from 10,000. And then we have a few of the of the balcony cabins that you talked about earlier, Carol, yeah. that you could get for five, six thousand per person. So there's really something for everybody. But our guests have a tendency to want to buy the, the suite and then that sells out first and then we sell down from there. And are you sold out? Like, give us an idea. Just remind us again, like Carnival talked about record bookings uh, and the outlook and talked about pricing power. So go there again, like in terms of your bookings, what are you seeing for 2024? What are you seeing in terms of pricing? We are definitely in a rising price environment. And in our environment, when you start to hit your targets, both from a booking and the yields that you're seeing, then you start to raise your prices, right? And so we are definitely right on target for 24. And honestly, 25 is actually showing some tremendous growth. We're, you know, 33% ahead of where we were same time last year, which is, you know, this year, because we have a tendency in the cruise business and particularly at Asimar Cruises, we book pretty far in advance. And so we're really in the prime booking window for 2025 right now. Interesting. Okay. Hey, give us an idea of, um, you talked a little bit about your customer, but but I'm wondering about the demographic profile of them. Uh, some sure. cruise companies like to appeal to families and, and bringing sort of multi-generations sure. on. Longer, longer cruises tend to attract those who are retired because they don't need to worry about taking so much vacation. Where are you? So, you know, it's funny because it's two things from an age perspective, you know, right in that 50, 55 is the sweet spot for us. But it's not just people that are retired. In fact, there's a lot of guests that actually really want to go on an Azamar cruise because they've tried other cruise lines and they know they like cruising, but they really want to get into this global um, destination immersion. And what does that mean? Right. So we will get to a beautiful place like Sicily, and we will get in at eight o'clock in the morning, we won't leave until the next day at five. Right. Not the same day at five. So what happens is right. we have a tendency to get the cruisers who want something that's more immersive and not just those who are retired, but our sweet spot is definitely in that age demographics. And while we certainly accommodate right. families, Okay. That's not our target. All right, Dondra, really appreciate getting some time with you. Uh, Dondra, uh, Dondra Ritzenthaler, she is the CEO of Azamara Cruises, joining us uh, on this Friday. Well, our next guest writes about a worrisome trend in the C-suite. Women lost about 60 C-suite roles at S&P Global Total Market Index companies in 2023. Carol, it's the first time the number of female execs at the very highest level of business dropped during the almost 20 year period tracked by S&P Global Market Intelligence. You know, I thought we were making progress. So what exactly is going on? Beth Coet is a Bloomberg Opinion senior columnist and in the new issue of Bloomberg Businessweek magazine, the new monthly issue, she writes about the declining numbers of female executives at a time when the political right is blasting DEI efforts. She joins us uh, from New York City, as we mentioned, featured this story in the new issue of Bloomberg Businessweek magazine that's on newsstands, online and on the Bloomberg. Term. So, Beth, what, what's going on here? Because you, you open talking about Roz Brewer over at a Walgreens Boots Alliance um, and she was she was out after 2020, just a couple of years after start. We all saw what happened yesterday to the company's stock, but it was sort of a long time coming. You use that as sort of like the lead in to explain what's happening um, at these companies. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really interesting. You, you mentioned, you know, I picked up on just sort of an alarming set of stats. Um, progress really seems to be backtracking. And Roz Brewer at Walgreens was a great example of that. When she became CEO of the company, she it was a record number of Fortune 500 CEOs. She was, when she was named CEO, she was the only Black female running a Fortune 500 company at the time. So, you know, it really felt like progress. It was celebrated by corporate America. And then less than two and a half years later, she was out. Um, and, you know, I, I think that this is, as you said, one of 60 C-suite women who had lost lost a job. Um, so I do think it really feels like a decline um, in a very painful way. All right, Beth, so tell us about this stall gender revolution. What's going on? Because it does feel like for years, right, we've talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, and, you know, specifically focused on a lot of aspects of that, but in particular, the gaps that were between men and women. And it looked like companies were sensitive about it. They were publishing data. Why are we now in a stall gender revolution? Yeah, so I, I, as you mentioned, you know, in the piece I say, I, I think that we've always seen progress and stalls and backlashes. And right now we are definitely in a stall. Um, and I think a big part of that is the climate right now. Um, we were in a period where people really did care about trying to increase diversity within their organizations. And now for a number of reasons, um, they're afraid to do that. They're afraid to talk about it. And I think that has changed the environment. Um, so we would recognize, we used to recognize the in just the last couple of years, we started to recognize these hurdles that women faced in the workplace. Um, and now I think that it's, I had a professor tell me it's it's okay to discriminate against women again. Um, and I think that's, that's a huge part of it. Yeah, you're quoting Aaron Reed, a professor at McMaster University's business school who studies gender in the workplace. You, you referenced, Beth, the idea that um, potentially, and you write about it in the piece, that Elon Musk and Bill Ackman have, to, um, you write that they've ratcheted up the rhetoric with posts on social media claiming DEI is racist and illegal. We've done a lot of reporting around sort of the corporate backlash to DEI. But one name in here that you do call out as, as not sort of being in the, on that same page is JP, Jamie Dimon over at J.P. Morgan Chase. What is he doing? Yeah, I mean, he puts out an annual letter every year, and in it, he dedicated this year quite a bit of space. The The, the letter itself was quite long, um, and in it, he dedicates a good amount of space to talking about why DEI is important to the company, to business. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we have seen now two of his potential successors are women in, in an industry that is predominantly white, is predominantly male. Um, you know, I think if you create an environment um, where women want to work, they'll come work for you. And I, I do think that elsewhere, we've seen women leave roles at companies that have been less supportive. Um, so I, th I think that this is a great example of what can happen when companies walk the walk. When they do, right? When they actually walk when the walk. When they do. Yeah. yeah. When they when they do. Having, Absolutely. Having said that, going back to Rosalind Brewer uh, at Walgreens Boots Alliance and her short tenure there, I, you know, I am curious in, in reporting this out that, you know, she inherited a company with issues and problems. And it doesn't seem like necessarily... There's a, ter there's a term for that, right? I, what do you I mean? I keep forgetting what that is. It it's was the, gla the glass cliff. Yes, the glass cliff. Oh, okay. And we spoke about it with one of our guests a few weeks ago, and she said that often women are brought in in these cases like go in ahead. a bad situation yeah yeah no no go there like it's just interesting the comparison between men being brought in to deal with a difficult situation how much time they're given to fix it versus a woman are we seeing really a gap in that yeah i mean i think there's two things one is that women in general tend to get the top job um, in these glass clip situations um, where they are brought into a struggling company um, and expected to turn things around. And I we've also seen in the numbers that they're not given as much time. The The length um, of tenure is, is significantly shorter for female CEOs than it is for male CEOs. Um, and, you know, in, Ro in Ross Bruce's case, she, she was not really given the time or the authority, right? She had her, the previous CEO um, was still very present, largest shareholder. Um, you know, when she took the job, they said they really liked her retail and digital experience. And when she left, 
they said, oh, they really actually wanted someone with more healthcare experience. I mean, they knew that going in, that that was her, her expertise. I don't, that's not her fault. And so I, I just think in general, it's pretty, it's typical that when women do get these big jobs, it is often at these companies that are really hard turnaround situations. I, yeah. I, I'm thinking of Mary Dillon over at Foot Locker. She's somebody who yeah. was brought in to turn around Foot Locker and it's, she's only been there for a short time, but yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Carol. It's a really, no, no, no. Hey, Beth, we only have about 45 uh, seconds left here. So now what? So what's next? Is there Now hope? what? <laughs> right. That's a, that's the question. I mean, uh, one, I'll leave you with sort of an optimistic note. And that is, I think that the, the, the last couple of years have shown women what is possible when their companies do recognize um, these hurdles that they face. And I think now women are not willing to go back and they're going to leave companies that don't support them. Um, they've just seen the other side of it. And, you know, I think that that is maybe one little ray of hope that we can take from this. Beth. Um, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of, sorry, I was actually quoting, like, what was the, what's the network uh, movie quote? Like, uh, um, I'm, I'm... I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Thank you, Paul (laughs) Brennan. Uh, But that's what I was thinking for Beth, right? Like that's how we finish, right? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. And I'm not going to like just settle for not getting to the top. Um, Beth, great story. Beth Coet, uh, senior columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. That is in the new monthly edition of Bloomberg Business Week, which is out on newsstands now on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com. And a great preview in our weekend show coming your way tomorrow. You're not going to forget that for a while. Yeah. I'm mad as hell. It's a great quote. This is Bloomberg.